I'm going to get started. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming out to our um, faculty fellow lecture series. This is our second one of the year. I'm going to introduce Dr. Maisha in a second, but I uh, just want to welcome you all on behalf of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education, UMI. Um, We've been around for 39 years, next year will be our 40th year, and since its inception, uh, UMI has been an institute that's really been focused on research for action. Right? Research that makes an impact, not only in the impact rating in journals, but actually an impact in communities. Uh, and this, the scholars that we've invited to participate in the faculty fellow lectureship really embody that. So this was our inaugural uh, year for instituting this, and you know, when I thought of the people that we really should have, uh, Dr. Wynn was at the forefront of that because there's a lot of research in education now, but very few people that are researching what's right in education or whose research is a part of what's right in education. And certainly, uh, Dr. Wynn's work fits in that mold and, and in the mold of, of the work that our institute has been, been trying to do, like I said, for the past four decades. So it's hard for me to read a bio because, uh, as many of you know, Mahesh and I went to graduate school together way, way back in the past century. Um, it's been a while, but I will try to read this. Uh, Dr. Maisha Wynn, um, who is now a Professor of Language, Literacy, and Culture of Education Studies at Emory University, um, received her Bachelor of Arts degree at UC Davis, her Master's in Language, Literacy, and Culture from Stanford, and her PhD from University of California, Berkeley. Um, great institution. Uh, <laughs> and also spent time here, so she is also part of the Teachers College uh, family, and in her postdoctoral study, managed to crank out a book based on a study she did here in New York. She's going to talk a little bit more about today. Uh, Writing and Rhythm, Spoken Word Poetry in Urban Classrooms, published by Teachers College Press. Um, some of her other books include Black Literate Lives, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives from Routledge, and most recently, Girl Time, Literacy, Justice, and the School to Prison Pipeline. Teachers College Press, um, some of the books are over here. Uh, basically, a couple of things that are really um, profound about Dr. Wynn's work that I think that you will find in, in her work. It, she has classroom perspectives, community perspectives, historical perspectives, present perspectives. All of them, I think, <coughs> acknowledge the dignity and power of, of voice and, and, and everyone's voice particularly those who have often been under-regarded or disregarded in the literature. Um, starting with people's own experiences and them telling their own experiences through this process of becoming literate as you know, a, a journey to emancipation, a journey to criticality, a journey to power that, that has happened not just in the present, but is, has defined African Americans and others' perspectives on literacy and learning. Um, and, and, and I think in that context, education has a, has a much broader uh, purpose than raising test scores, right? That education becomes about gaining a sense of power over your own voice. Um, Dr. Wynn is also the recipient of early career award at AERA, an organization of 15,000 members, right? So to, to win this award it, it is quite an honor. Ranks are up there amongst the very best in our field. And um, even though early is, is one of the modifiers, already a <laughs> career's worth of scholarship prior to coming to the academy as an elementary and high school teacher, um, and now um, an academic rock star. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lynch. This is one of my intellectual homes, and I feel quite at home here at Teachers College after doing my postdoc here. And really because of the work that I was able to do in the community, I have to just, first of all, thank um, Professor Morell and Veronica Holly and all of the amazing people at UMI. I am so excited by what's happening at UMI right now. You can just feel the energy in this room, and I know you guys have had a lot of events this year that have gotten me moving and shaking and inspired, and I'm so um, humble and grateful to be a part of this movement. Um, I also just um, need to say that um, there was uh, uh, the, the project really came out of a conversation with Professor Maria Torres Guzman, who is a professor here, and she told me about a quote unquote little poetry program in the Bronx at University Heights High School. And her friend was the principal of the school. She said, I think she'll let you go and see what's going on. And so I was here, I was thinking about what my 
next sort of work would be, I looked at spoken word poetry uh, venues in Northern California and black owned and operated bookstores and I really wanted to think about the ways in which classroom teachers were adapting uh, uh, spoken word poetry um, and what I call participatory literacy community tenants in their classroom. And so this little poetry program ended up being so much more. It ended up being a movement and that's power writing. And so I'm gonna talk to you about following this work, not just during that one year as an ethnographer here during my postdoc fellowship, but also looking at longitudinal data and following the students' lives over the course of 10 years. And with that said, I have to acknowledge that one of the power writers, who's a new power writer, who wasn't even there when I was there, but it just shows how the generations keep going, and Joseph is back there with his mentor. There are urban work people here. But I just have to give a shout out to Joseph because I'm so grateful that he made time to come here. Um, Acknowledge Joseph Ubilace, who was the classroom teacher who I worked with, and um, most of my teachers who I roll with, Joseph and um, Amy Sultan and Roland Lagarde Laura, they're after school teachers, so they're going to teaching after school. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also just um, have to thank my husband and my son, my 17 year old son here, because traveling, you know, with my son and doing the work that I do is like imperative to have a partner who's supporting me. So I want to thank them. And my cousin just rolled up. And I will talk about him later, but my cousin James Shields is here, and Hip Hop Coloring Book, right here. We'll talk about that later. So thank you for being here. Um, this is a story about literacy, and this is a story about resilience. This is a story co-authored with a collective of youth who often receive messages from both inside and outside their communities about how important it was to attend college, be literate, well-read, and well-spoken, and how they used their funds of knowledge, their ways of knowing and being, to build literate okay. identities that were not merely culturally relevant, but what my colleague Django Paris calls culturally sustained. Mm -hmm. Becoming literate, or unearthing one's literate identity, for many of the youth in this story, was inspired in part by a classroom teacher Joseph Williams and his comrades and co-teachers, Amy Sultan and Roland Lagarde Laura, who co-facilitated a process called Power Writing, in which young people learn to resist anyone's attempt to colonize them or unfairly confine them to singular and thus one-dimensional labels. This is a story about teachers who continued to leave their classroom door open, even in the absence of a formal building or institution. In the fall of 2003, I was admitted, and I'll come back to this notion of being admitted later, to this community of power writers and thinkers in the Bronx, New York. I journeyed with these young people, African American, Central American, Dominican, Puerto Rican, West Indian, and their teachers who define themselves as black, Puerto Rican, Jewish, Italian, who, um, through the lively labyrinth that we call New York City. Like many scholars, I immersed myself in this writing community and I exchanged my instinct to know it all for an opportunity to be schooled by Joseph, or Joe, who I'll refer to him as throughout this paper, and his students, who used the power writing class and method to exchange their original writing to give and receive feedback. What began as a study became an opportunity for me to decolonize my own research methods through a humanizing and collaborative process. At first glance, one might refer to power writing as a program. However, it has become so much more. Power writing is a worldview that embraces the multiple languages and literacies of all people, exalts students' knowledge and students' way of knowing and being, and embodies the notion that all youth indeed have the right to be literate. The notion of power writing being a worldview is evidence in its alumni who continue to grow with the circle once they graduate from high school. Power writing alumni continue their work in the world as writers in a variety of settings, including colleges and universities, workplace settings, and unfortunately for two of our poets, in and out of prison cells and on probation periods. Every power writer's story is layered and nuanced in the way they experience building and sustaining their literate identities. I have systematically followed the lives of four power writing alumni, Amanda, Arlene, Ramon, and Ron. However, there are other power writing alumni, Eli, and Joseph, and Pearl, and other stories that are equally valuable, alive, and full of wisdom, and their voices will also be included throughout 
about this talk. My initial decision to focus on these four young writers was purposeful. Amanda, Arlene, Ramon, and Ron in many ways represented the betwixt and between lives of power writers, which ranged from being a Gates Millennium Scholar to a resident on Rikers Island. These betwixt and between lives include the stories of first-generation college students who matriculated through underserved schools and emerged from under-resourced communities, yet pursued academic excellence while maintaining linguistic diversity, while maintaining love for their families, and relevance to the communities that shaped them. These young people found the dream keepers in their schools. That is, they connected with the teachers and adult allies who patiently worked with and for them with the firm conviction that these young people had gifts to offer the world. Power writing alumni demonstrate that education and literacy are not synonymous with acting white, and that being designated to a school or attending a school where most students qualify for free and reduced lunch does not mean that there is no one in your home who values reading, writing, and thinking. In fact, power writers past and present draw from their sociocultural resources or inspiration, including their families, teachers, communities, and most importantly, each other. As I continue to follow the Power Writers, a collective of youth poets, grades 9 through 12, who started at University Heights High School, but expanded to include all other high schools, and who for a brief time were housed in the New Rican Poets Cafe, I am compelled by the following questions. How do we understand the relationship between literacy and identity, and what does it really mean to be literate from the student's perspective? and what sustains their literate lives? And how can the culture of a youth-centered literacy program, writing program, and power writing in particular, spur the creation of a serious literate life? These questions were illuminated during my data collection process in myriad of ways, and more specifically in what would happen when I would interview my, uh, plan my interviews with power writing alumni. Uh, in December 2011, Amanda, Arlene, Joe, and I made plans to meet at UNI, at the UNI office in the historic Teresa Towers in Harlem to have our exit interviews. When Joe arrived, he was accompanied by power writing alumni Eli, who was a part of the original project. And both Joe and Eli were on a teaching high after co-facilitating a power writing class in a learning center in a Connecticut housing project where they're teaching right now. I had not seen Eli for some time. However, we always sent readings through Joe and other students. And when Eli learned I was scheduled to meet Ron the next day, he said that he would be joining him. And I was excited, but it was also a New York City weekend, so I knew that plans could change. However, that following evening, when I met Ron, Eli was there, as well as a younger power writer, Joseph, who I had not had the pleasure of meeting before that evening. These three young men were living their literacy. Ron carried Ralph Ellison's unfinished second novel, while Eli held tightly to his black journal and pen, taking notes throughout our conversation. And Joseph sported his t-shirt from the famous Strand bookstore, boasting 18 miles of books. The three of them were giddy from their Friday night out. When I inquired where they went the night before, they proudly boasted that they hung out in Barnes and Nobles. That's our club, Joseph explained, followed by a lively conversation about how surprised and delighted they were to find out that women actually liked literate and smart men. <laughs> What I find most compelling about Power Writing Collective was whenever an adult ally would make one phone call to Power Writing, to a Power Writer, to get together, to build, to share details or event, an event of interest, many Power Writers would converge in solidarity, sincere interest, and the desire to connect. I mean, here it was a Saturday evening in New York City, you guys, and these three young men took three hours with me to discuss and debate definitions of literacy, what it meant to be literate and how power writing continue to support them in creating and sustaining literate lives. And so I'm someone who you cannot tell me that our children don't care about their education, that they don't care about their literacy, that they don't care about all the things that we hear people crit criticizing them for. One set of questions I asked included, define literacy. What does it mean to be literate? How are you literate? How did your family, community, peers support you in being literate? And Ron began this conversation. I want to go through a series with Ron and Joseph and Eli talking about their literacy. So I'm going to let them speak for themselves. Literacy, it becomes different as far as with us being uh, people of color and and because of our, our, our existence and how we are brought up in our uh, social, political, economic traditions, there's a difference between that. 
So as far as we need to be highly, um, I guess, skillful in deciphering what we're doing versus just taking it as, oh, this is beautiful, this is and work and stuff like that. But we need to be like, I right. Because of like, like you said, we don't know how to spell as proper. We don't know how to define proper. So yes, we need to carry a dictionary with us and say, okay, let me stop real quick. Let me underline this, let me write this down, and we try to break down what this word really means. And I think Joel talked about that etymology of the word yeah. and trying to figure out, you know, what is it, where do it come from, where do it originate from, so we can see how it truly functions in the work itself. So to be literate, I think to be literate, to be black or Latino literate in a literacy of as, as, as far as I'm concerned, we need to be able to to also realize the, the beauty of the work, but also to understand. We need to like be skillful at really breaking down into it to make sure that we fully understand it because our educations are completely different from from the upper class groups. You mean I was in the reading the whole reading and writing beforehand. I was like, oh whatever, let me go watch X TV or something like that. Um it, even then like as I've seen it's like it was contagious. As I've seen the other people, they wanted me to um, be this like, you know, in a weird way, like, oh, I see them having books, I should, I should pick up the book now. Um, it was like a more positive energy from where I was from. I was just like, the kind of corner where guys that all they do was smoke weed, have sex, and fight people. So when I, when I went here, it was kind of like a church. It was like church for me, in a clear way. Um, <coughs> It, I just I had got this for like a like a feeling and um yeah and then after that I like now I before like I was um I was in um, part time special when I was in high school uh, high school and well my whole school years um I had a the resource room and I had an IED with me and it was only in such wet and um with the parents that I was I was came that um like just right now last week I did like a Five page paper in like 30 minutes, and I got these girls. And I wasn't going to do it to be honest, but I was going to do it anyway. Um, and like with our it, it made me want to become smart in a weird way. Um, and as well as with poetry, like when, when I first got around, I didn't understand anything he was saying in the poem. I mean, <laughs> then like now, I'm like, okay, you know, and now I, I get the gist of it more. And like, it's, it's better to be intellectual. It's better to be intellectual. I mean, music for me became, the, the writing became music for me. When I understood it like that, that all like had a large sort of sense of like, okay, this is how I can get it. This is exactly how I can understand it. So that's a strong I mean, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to, I, I knew the mechanical yeah. but to do five page paper on something that I have a I had an interest or it's an assignment, you know, I just I didn't look at it as anything else but a plan. A lot of plans. Um and joy and say kind of idea that the word is music. The word you know, you know, in the first circle, he was like a lot of small a lot of things you kept talking about, and I said that's something man, one of the prior things, um, Joe kept saying, like, you know, say your piece like a song, especially to the same thing. Sing your singer, sing your song. And I was like, oh, I'll do the, you know what, let's do this Miles Davis style. You know, let me try to look it like that. Let me break the words down. Literacy for me became where it's supposed to that challenge. Um, it became a goal. You know, it became an interest in it. Not just a challenge, but an obstacle. Well, not, not just an obstacle, but um, but I think there was more to it that whether I would get it or not, striving to understand it and go through the the spelling, the uh, philology, the linguistics now, the, the root words have a history in themselves. So um, the power of the word became that much more grander. And then I added to that notion that it shows this one of the things that always strikes me when I see the clip of Akiva is 10 years later, he's quoting his English teacher. You know, he really held on to this notion that words 
for like music, that language could be like music. And when you're sharing your work and reading your work, you can sing your work. You can sing your work like a song. And then what was really interesting is the conversation that ensued after that about the ways in which their definitions of literacy have changed over time. So for example, one of the things that Ron marveled over was that initially he saw literacy as competitive. Okay, he was always trying to catch up with other people. And he didn't want people to talk, you know, talk over him or to be taken advantage of. And then that opened up this conversation about the ways in which the habits that they learned from power writing actually inspired them to be able to go back into books, that it was okay to actually look words up. Um, Eli said that power writing removed the shackles of shame. And Ron continued, you know, we learned a lot of good habits. He said he used to be embarrassed to go back in the book, and that power writing, what they gave him was to be able to go back, that it's okay to go and look up words and look up concepts, okay? And that's what we all do when we're reading as grad students, as scholars. We go back, we, we reread things. And that somewhere in their educational trajectory, they felt that going back was something to be ashamed of. So removing those shackles of shame that seemed to generate fear of going back into the text or looking up a word or understanding a concept was part of the decolonizing mission of Joe, Amy, and Roland in the context of power writing. And going back, according to Eli and Ron, served as a marker that one did not, uh, did not, not belong in an academic setting simply because they just didn't get it the first time. Participating in this literate community and learning that in order to be critically literate, one had to return to the book and interrogate the text as much as possible in order to generate even more questions was one way that these young people built their literary identities. And this story, or collection of stories, refused to add to what Eve Tuck calls damage-centered research. Tuck argues that there are consequences when scholars and scholarship rely on the hard luck stories of individuals or communities that support the narratives of inequities and gaps in academic achievement. This pathologizing approach according to Tuck, pathologizing approach to research according to Tuck, quote, operates even benevolently from a theory of change that establishes harm or injury in order to achieve reparation, end of quote. And also, um, in, in uh, her work, and this is in my work also with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated youth in the urban southeast, um, I just found it critically important to think about the ways in which the youth I work with practice self-determination through a particular way of desiring. And one of the things that Tuck talks about with desire is that she's yearning for a more inclusive definition of desire that says that desire is smart and it's purposeful and it's intentional and it can make decisions and it can strategize and that desire can enjoy self-determination. And I would argue that the young people in this power writing community desire literate lives and that it's very intentional, it's very purposeful. Um, so I want to take us beyond the Bronx and look at what this work looks like out in the world and more specifically um, some work that we did with power writing in the context of Mayan Waste Puerto Rico. Gathered in a brightly lit media center in a vocational high school in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico, power writing alumni, and I put alumni in quotes, and you'll understand why later, Amanda Arlene, Ramon, and Ron asked a group of approximately 40 students to form smaller groups in order to create read and feed circles. In these intimate circles, young people exchange poetry and prose about their lived experiences, and more specifically, their neighborhoods using footprint maps of, their, of the neighborhoods and communities that they largely associated with their acquisition of language and literacy that they drafted during the first half of the workshop, students articulated ideas about the ways in which the environment could impact one's individual growth and transformation. Since it was my first time to Puerto Rico, I was so overwhelmed by the warmth and loving people, the piercing blue sky, the vivid greens, and the abundant sunshine that I really did not imagine many of the contrasting images students painted of addiction and violence in their neighborhoods. Students offered testimonies that illustrated their desire to rise above it all, and almost a sense of peer pressure and determination to not be defined by their communities if they were under-resourced communities. Emilio began his reading 
with a story about being moved from one part of the island to another. And Amelia was one of the students in this vocational high school. And every time we told people we were going to these high schools, it seemed, vocation seemed to be code for they're not going to go to college, they're not necessarily academically inclined. And I think we really found that that was not true when we met these young people. When Emilio offered his footprint map, he had areas that were outlined in green, which he called safe spaces. He had areas outlined in blue, which were his neighbors, and red, which were the danger spots. And he said, I painted the safe zones and the danger spots. We don't have too many danger spots, but they are really dangerous, began Emilio. And I work here, pointing to a safe space, and I live here, again, pointing to a safe space, and I train here, pointing to a baseball park, which he also indicated as a safe space. So I need to be moving near those dangerous spots. And I have two younger brothers and sisters. And when my parents got separated, I was, Emilio paused, searching for the word he wanted to use. Another student offered tempted, and another student offered torn. And Emilio chose the former to describe the pressure he was feeling to bring money into his household to support his mother and siblings. And Emilio continued, I started attending the church, and I thank God for that, and there's really no better place than your home and then your house. And I believe that the things around you can influence you, but they don't determine what you do. The things around you are not an excuse to what you do. When I received the invitation to be the keynote speaker at the University of Puerto Rico, my ways, English as a Field of Change and Flow conference sponsored by their English department, and some of you know Dr. Mary Safranik, who was here at Teachers College. She was the host for this conference. I was clear that the only compensation that I needed was to bring Joe and as many counterwriters as they could support. Building on Joe's tradition of going out into the world with his students, he boarded a plane with Amanda, Arlene, and Ron, and Ramon in New York City on February 19, 2009, as I boarded a plane in Atlanta, Georgia, and we met in San Juan, Puerto Rico. We were charged with the mission of facilitating power writing workshops at two vocational high schools, as well as facilitating workshops for graduate students and teachers at UPRN. It never occurred to me that our trip to Puerto Rico would be the first time one of our students, Ron, flew on an airplane. And when Joe first started teaching in the Bronx, many of his students journeyed to visit family in the Dominican Republic, affectionately referred to DR, of course, and Puerto Rico, but seldom have ever visited other New York City boroughs. Joe insisted that all of his students travel, quote unquote, off the block and become what he called train warriors accessing worlds both familiar and strange. Puerto Rico was new to all of us, with the exception of Joe, who was of Puerto Rican descent, yet he had not been able to get to Puerto Rico for longer than he cared to think about. All of us were nervous about translating power writing to students in my high schools without having spent more time getting to know students, teachers, and their school culture. However, the power writing pedagogy lends itself to such scenarios. Youth serve as facilitators and guides, and through the process, we did indeed learn a lot about the young people we worked with in the states, and they learned a lot about us. Power writing pedagogy is less about teachers teaching and more about teachers listening to students, engaging when and where to enter as a co-facilitator. Joe and I got out of the power writer's way. It was evident that Ron and Ramon and Arlene and Amanda had a sense of how they wanted to introduce the world. As a classroom teacher, Joe always found it revealing when observing his students present the work of the power writers. It helped him understand what they were hearing from him in class, and it became a part of his practice. And this was not the first time that Joe and I faded into back the background as teachers. We removed ourselves from the teaching circle and witnessed the transformation of power writers from students to co-facilitators of a participatory literacy community. Amanda, Arlene, and another poet, student poet, Jonathan, conducted a writing workshop for the National Council Teachers of English annual, annual convention here in New York City in 2007. I think the session had like 50 people, and you had teachers and scholars and researchers participating in the power writing process. On a separate occasion, Amanda, Arlene, and Ron did a panel at NYU for English educators and talked to them about the process and the kinds of lessons that they thought English educators should know about teaching literacy and teaching writing and teaching reading. And this new opportunity in Puerto Rico, we were invited to engage the students at the vocational high schools as well as the teachers, the graduate students, there were a lot of stakeholders here. And here, the power writing alumni also had the opportunity to build with students who they believed shared a similar lived experience 
and introduced them to what they considered a pedagogy of possibility that often redirected negativity and feelings of hopelessness into proact being proactive and exercising agency in one's own education. And I'm going to, I have to turn this down because we found this was a little loud. So let me just turn this down. And so the next um, clip that I want to share is the power writers introducing themselves in this context. And it's interesting because throughout this work, I found that I've analyzed a lot of discourse around introductions. It's always so interesting to me the way the teachers and the young people introduce themselves in the different contexts, whether they're at workshops for teachers, whether they're at other high schools, whether they're at conferences, because there's something in that discourse about the way that they're talking about themselves and the way that they're presenting their work that I think they even think more and learn more about what it is that they're doing. Anytime that we have a chance to talk about what we're doing or try to explain what we're doing to somebody else, I think this happens. Same word. Um, right now I'm a major at um, taking English. So I was one in your position, um, you know, in a school where <laughs> no one believed in us, but now, you know, we're at college ground and we're on a track to be I guess professionals are something that we want to be yourself. So, um, as a speaker, no, I'm not speaking. Spanish is off. But I just want to see My name is Ramon. Um, I graduated from University Heights in the Bronx, just like David. Um, then I went to Greenwich University near Boston, Massachusetts, and now I work in in Boston, helping public high school students. My name is Joseph Lopez. Uh, I was a high school teacher. All of these people call my students in high school. Uh, now I'm the director of Calabar at the New York Regional Public Cafe. The New York Regional Public Cafe spoke a word set and object of the public and the buildings. Teacher researcher positionality. 
However, we have come to think of everyone in the power writing circle as a worthy witness of sorts. In the first phase of worthy witnessing <coughs> admission, facilitators must introduce and even expose themselves to the community. Um, in the second phase, we talk about declaration or unmasking the socio or political ideologies that are behind the work that you're doing. And in the third phase, we talk about revelation. And that's really where the student, the teacher researcher, uh, the university researcher, there's one collaborate and achieve acceptance of each other through mutual respect. And in the last phase, confidentiality, is really when we're thinking about what part of this work, what story is what stories are ours to tell? I mean, a lot of our young people have been so generous with their work and their poetry, and they may feel differently sharing a piece at 15 than they would feel with this work being out there when they're 20. And so I think that for those of us who are doing this work, and I know there are emerging scholars in this, in this room, we have to think about the implications for that. And even if young people give us permission to, to share their work, I think we have to think about work that you know, talking to them about work that they may not want out in the world later on. It's, it's uncertain. I also think there's this interesting piece, and I always love this piece of um, Professor Morell's work. In his critical literacy book, there's this wonderful section where he talks about the students we work with. They have these fabulous, you know, 100-page portfolios of their research notebooks, and a co-PI, you know, tells Professor Morell, oh, we should get those. It's really like, good stuff in there, right? And, you know, of course there was good stuff in there, and, and it, would, it would make sense that you'd want to look at that as far as your data analysis. But he realized, you know, that's our students' work, and they need to leave here with this work, and that, that work is not ours. And so that's just a way to sort of think about what we're calling worthy witnessing. Arlene chose to position herself as once having sat where the students in the high school sat, perhaps a school space where there was a misconception of student abilities and desires. And Ramon quite humbly mentioned that he was a graduate from college, but focused on the fact that he was working with high school students to get into college and, most importantly, graduate from college. Joe teasingly asserted that Arlene had at least one good teacher, of course, referencing himself, as a way to acknowledge that there are always teachers who believe in their students, even when the school culture seems confining. And Joe made it a point to highlight that while some of the power writers came back to teach or make a little money and get themselves published, that the critical component of the program, if you heard him, was to read, write, think, and take ownership of the space. Amanda punctuated her brief introduction with her desire to work with high school students. And in my introduction, I chose to underscore the relationships in the power writing community between students and teachers. Additionally, I thought it was important to let students know that that was my first time in their home, in their space, and I appreciated them having me in their space positioning myself as a guest and thus showing humility for my host. <clears throat> Ron, uh, like so many students I've encountered throughout my work, who I first met in fall 2003, who introduced the pedagogy of, play, of, play, of um, pedagogy of power writing, arrived to my office here at Teachers College in 2003 with journals full of original poetry and prose. He was merely waiting for a teacher to ask the right kinds of questions in order to learn that he was indeed a writer. And when Ron discovered that Joe's classroom was a permissive space, he shared the work and continued to grow it. And when I first met Ron in 2003, he was taking classes at Ron's Community College. However, he chose to continue to be a part of a community that affirmed him and continued to help him develop the skills that he needed for college coursework as well as the workplace. Ron worked with Joe, Amy, and Roland on his writing, and they encouraged him to share drafts of his written assignments so they could support his efforts to become a more fluent writer. When Ron, Ron understood power writing to be a movement where everyone, including the students and teachers, found ways to be better readers, writers, and to be literate. And in the power writing circle, teachers are sharing their work. They're writing, they're workshopping, they're getting feedback from the students. Ron's use and ownership over the word literate was an objective in power writing. A pedagogy of literacy in which teachers deliberately and explicitly discuss literacy and its power encourages students to grapple with its multiple definitions while creating transformative spaces in which young people build endurance in their quest for literate identities. Ron, who enjoyed working with emerging poets and writers, also asserted that literacy and being literate meant learning everything about the world. And Ron's introduction set the tone for the day's work. 
And when Ron went on to talk to the students about what he wanted them to do, he asked them to respond to the following questions. Where did you learn to read? Where did you learn to write? Just explain your neighborhood. What is your neighborhood about? What's happening in that neighborhood? Just map out and give us an idea of how you live. And this whole mapping of your neighborhood and where you became literate is something that Joe and I have sort of taken into English education classrooms throughout the country and working with teachers. And so we've done that work in the Southeast where I actually work with pre-service English teachers who are going to teach middle school and high school English language arts. And one of the things that we learn in this exercise is that a lot of us who are seated at the English education table are people who can tell stories about what it meant to have a sense of intimacy with reading, writing, and speaking. So many of the pre-service teachers we work with in my program talked about reading on their parents' lab, their grandparents' lab, going to the library with a family member, being able to purchase and pick out books, receiving books as gifts. And it's, it's really interesting the way Joe takes them through this process of thinking about, okay, that's wonderful. And we have, to, we have to create this sense of intimacy around literacy in our classrooms. Because everybody can sit on somebody's lap and read, but that doesn't mean they can't develop this relationship with literacy. You know, so our English education teachers create these maps in which they talk about their literate lives, where they acquired language, where they acquired literacy. They talk through them. And then they create a piece of poetry or prose, and they share that work. And that's what the students were doing in Puerto Rico. Prior to creating the smaller circles, the students drafted these footprint maps. And once they completed the task, um, our power writers took them into smaller groups. And in both circles, students were invited to talk through their maps in Spanish or English or a combination of both. Prior to reading their piece, each student had to select a feeder. And one of the reasons why in the power writing circle you ask for someone to give feedback, you let them know ahead of time, is because then it invites a particular way of really, really listening. So you already know if I've asked you to be my feeder that you're going to be asked to give me some feedback. So you're already sort of getting prepared for that and you're listening in particular ways that you know you can give feedback. So in Ron and Amanda's circle, there was a student named Yaya who shared her map and short essay that discussed her life between New York City and Puerto Rico. And she asked Ron to feed her. And she talked about moving between New York City and Puerto Rico and sort of having a foot in both places, but also really missing her life in New York City, but being happy that her family was reconnected again in Puerto Rico. And the feed that Ron gave her was, I really like the fact that you express how much you missed your hometown, but also you love being here too. And you're in the middle. You, you, you can really hear that you're caught in the middle, but you also express what it means to be in that middle ground. And Yaya asked Ron if he planned to share his work as well, which is a tenant of power writing. The teacher writes when the students write. The teacher reads when the students read. And the teachers are what I have referred to in my work as practitioners of the craft, OK? So English teachers are actually reading books. I'm always asking my pre-service teachers, what are you reading? You know, just coming in a random day, what are you reading? You should always be working on reading something. What are you writing? What are you working on? We can't just assign things. We have to be this. We have to be whatever this is. How can we say this is important if we don't practice it, if we don't do it? <coughs> so Ron shares his map, his map. And he's done this many times, but every time you do it all over again. And he talks about living near Yankee Stadium, and he shows the students his map. And then he talks about moving to Soundview, and we have the Cross Bronx Expressway, he tells the kids. It's a highway that goes over people's communities, so you can see a bunch of cars pass while you sit in your house drinking coffee. Then, when, then we have the Brooklyn Expressway, which is another highway that goes between neighborhoods. And many students in the circle, like Yaya, were familiar with New York City, while others saw it as a desirable location, or more desirable than Puerto Rico. It was evident that the students who had the New York City connections had a particular kind of credibility in the circle. And Ron didn't take it for granted that all of the kids even were familiar with New York City, and so he focused on the highways and the expressways. And after sharing his map, Ron teasingly sat down as if he didn't have a poem or piece to share. And the students got it. They were like, wait a minute, you were supposed to share a piece too. But he was teasing them. So he got up and he shared his work. And when Ron finished, he promptly sat down and the students cheered. And then also because of the kind of technology where we're in, it's so funny how many smartphones and camera phones the students are all recording and while he's doing his poetry and they're saying they're sending it to their relatives and friends in New York City. But conjuring images of pipeline between schools and prison, 
Ron's poem that he shared in this context indicts the community for comparing the schoolyard to the prison yard, as well as the elders who are merely observing and watching while calling our young people lazy, but not actually doing anything to disrupt this pipeline. Ron is keenly aware of the testing culture that permeates the country, and not just New York City. Troubling the fear of citywide tests, Ron conjures images of children stuffing their mouths with candy, with nervous energy, and a particular kind of hunger that cannot be satisfied by school lunch. For Ron, this was a straightforward poem where he confronted issues explicitly, which is much different from his previous work that used a more stream of conscious approach and favored symbols and imagery. His personal growth as a writer demonstrated that he never really left the power writing circle. In fact, he continued to participate in class when he was unable, and he actually created an offshoot of the power writing group at his community college. And so I want to just take us through very quickly the other two student artists who went to University of Puerto Rico to do this work. And what you'll see on the next slide is you'll see the poems that they wrote specifically for the 2009 trip to Puerto Rico. And then you'll hear these students, Amanda and Arlene, talk about how they define literacy now. What does it mean to you? I mean, in today's, today's world, there's so many changes going on, especially in the politics. So, um, just understanding how that affects us and knowing the changes that they're making and knowing and being able to break it down and think how how does it affect the end of the day? That's really interesting. Yeah. And okay, so who's making changes? So they are making changes. Like um, you know, there's the 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 new um national organization. Where they, it's uh, the military now that they can because if you know they can call you a terrorist and take you away and and not put you on trial and keep you in jail for so long, so a lot of people not understanding what exactly does that mean. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for people to understand to to be able to understand to be able to break things down. Being literate and being so taught. It's not putting yourself in a book. It's if you want to go to a museum, which I've done. My husband and I go to a museum. That's her baby in the background. <laughs> he always says, oh, you, you, you're like your story. I'm like, is that guy? It's like, no, he just, I never knew, I never knew that the Bronx was owned by a Bronx family, or I never knew um, about the cloisters and, <laughs> Even things that I thought that I used to, you know, things I used to take for, for granted, I'll end up talking about it, even talking to my husband. And that's so interesting hearing you talk about um, your husband saying to you that he always sees you with some sort of um, learning tool or research tool, Google or dictionary. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about what literacy means in the context of you having a family, being a wife and a mother, and how. This particular way of being literate through power writing through influences your family and and also um, inspires the kinds of activities that you do with your husband and that you do with your daughter. Can you talk about that? Yeah, of course. Um, I can honestly say that while I was not working while I was pregnant on maternity leave, I would have thought that I would have felt that I should be working, that I should be up and moving and a smarter mom. But because of literacy, I was writing, I was reading, um, I was engaging in uh, the museum, I was at the library. I did not miss working, I didn't miss it. Just because I found that my mind would take me elsewhere. And as a culminating event in Puerto Rico, Arlene, Amanda, Ramon, and Juan were invited to give a poetry reading to close the conference. And it was more than appropriate, of course, that they had the last word. And so typically at the end of a conference, everyone's exhausted. Some participants are leaving early, or other people are using that time for social media. 
However, all of the faces that we saw throughout our visit were present and hungry to hear from all of their quote unquote teachers that weekend. And Joe introduced the Power Writers and he said, Buenas tardes, here it is. I'd like to welcome you to a performance by the Power Writers. We are presently held, housed in the famous New York Region Poetry Cafe. It's a small poetry circle. We have approximately 40 students across two high schools and a university, but hundreds of students have come through our door. I have four of my former students here who continue to be my students, and it is a lifetime circle, and that's what I need you to know. They're not my, just my former students, but this is a lifetime circle. <coughs> and embedded in the introduction is the philosophy that sets the power writing program a set of, a, apart from other programs. The real work in many ways begins when the students are out in the world. And here I use work in reference to coursework in colleges and universities, work with other youth, including mentoring, younger siblings, nieces and nephews, jobs, and daily encounters requiring reading, writing, speaking, and thinking. So I want us to hold on to this idea of the lifetime circle as I talk a little bit about what is the work. And one of the things that I'm finding as I continue to do my work is to move away from a conversation about what works because there's a lot of work to do and think about what work, what is the work. And a lot of this work comes out of my work with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated girls and this notion of gender justice in which scholars like Covington and Bloom talk about what is the work ahead, what is it that we have to do. Civil rights icon Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in what would turn out to be his last manuscript, Where Do We Go From Here? <laughs> Chaos or Community, contends that the social pathology in American school systems impedes educational and the job of the school, according to King, is to teach so well that family background is no longer an issue. Power writing ideology embraces the ver this very notion, but extends it to invite you to think about their cultural knowledge and its power in the classroom setting and beyond. And I would extend Dr. King's observation to education research methodologies as well. My job and your jobs as emerging scholars or English educators interested in the ways in which youth build and sustain literate identities is to work with young people and their teachers and to listen for desire and determination in their work with as much fervor as the stories of heartache and despair. And while I do not seek to undermine the fact that many young people I have worked with have experienced some of the worst of what our communities and schools have to offer, I know from listening and being a worthy witness in Joe's classroom and other classrooms that youth excavate paths that in many cases adults in their lives are unable to see. And these young people's lives tell us, a much, tell, tell us as much about what is possible as they tell us about what is problematic. And so in thinking about what is the work, I think one of the things is this notion of creating networks. So I think it's really important that power writing alumni knew that they could return to their teachers, and I say teachers because it was really a collective of teachers who worked with them, return to their community of teachers when they needed support as college students. One of the things that we did was we asked for their syllabi ahead of time. So we would have a sense of what they're reading, what their assignments were, so we knew what kinds of support we needed to give them. So how do we create those networks? Now Ramon, who graduated from, from Randolph, he was a posse scholar. And so he knew from his experience with Posse the power of moving with a group, not just getting scholarship money, but actually having consistent check-ins with someone to make sure that they are being successful and have the kind of support that they needed academically. But I also think of that about the work with Encrust here, an institute for student achievement with small learning communities in New York City, and now they're doing the work in Detroit, they've been doing the work in Atlanta, where teachers are planning across grade levels. So grade level team meetings are taking the place of department meetings. So if there is a young person and there's a community of teachers planning at a grade level team meeting, they've seen that young person in all of their classes. They've seen them in the classes where they excel and where they are passionate. They've seen them in the classes that are frustrating to them. And that team of teachers can really build a safety net around these young people. I think another part of what the work is, is making literacy goals explicit in English education. For some reason, I think the, the, the grown folks go into the room and we make up the plans and we have our objectives, but we haven't really let the young people in on what those objectives and goals are. And one of the things that I think sets power writing apart from a regular traditional English class is that the teachers are constantly goal setting with the students. They're talking about the objectives together, so the students are a part of this. 
And then the last piece that I think is part of the work is really embedded in what uh, scholar Ruth Nicole Brown says, that students, young people need power, not just programs. And I think the power in power writing is that the young people are the, the first and foremost stakeholders, that they are the ones who are at the table, that they are the ones who are invited to think about their literacy and how their literacy looks in the world. And now I'd like to open up for a conversation and dialogue and questions. And I thank you so much. Good time for a few questions. Are we? Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about the process of being admitted, which I find really interesting um, during your talk and what that entailed as somebody you were obviously there for, for years and ethnographer, but you know, generally what that entails in terms of being part of communities. Of yeah. Research. Well, it's interesting because when I first embark on the work and I write about this a little bit in writing in rhythm, um, the space was the student space. So it wasn't really up to Joe, or he chose to have a space where it wasn't just him saying, you can come in my classroom and work with my students. His piece was my students have to accept you being here. They have to want you to be want you here. And so it was interesting because, you know, I was coming from sort of a different dynamic with my, you know, teacher education program from California and even school experience as a teacher where, you know, you go and do research, you check in with the principal, you check in with the teacher, they give you permission to be there, boom, you're there. And so this was the first time I actually went in a space. It was everything that I thought I believed in, right? And this is the first time I went in the space and he said, okay, it's not here, you're great, it's nice to meet you, but we'll see what the students think and they'll decide if you can be here or not. And so part of that admission process was also that I had to be writing, I had to be sharing my work. And they had classes on Saturdays and I was like, Saturday? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't work on Saturday, you know, like, that's my day. And it's like, no, classes on Saturday, we meet at night, you gotta be there. And this is from the kids. You, the kids say, you have to, you have to write, you share your work, you be class on Saturday, work class on Saturday at night. And so that was part of the admission process. And I'm telling you, it blew my mind because it really did shift what I thought. Like, I didn't even realize how much privilege I would take into a place where I was, quote, unquote, doing my research, where I asked permission from the people who I thought I needed permission from. But here was a classroom space where, uh-uh, the permission had to come from the young people. So that's admission. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It's really inspiring work. Thank you. So it started out mostly after school around Saturday mm -hmm. prayer. Mm -hmm. What have been your process in seeing how it come into the classroom during the school? Mm -hmm. Well, it's really interesting. So I'll take you back a little bit. Joe um, was a classroom teacher at University Heights High School. He taught everything from astronomy to math to English to music appreciation. I mean, they had him all over the place. And um, many of you are familiar with, in the small learning communities, they have um, family groups or advisories where students, like a group of really shouldn't be one of the <coughs> students. But there is one adult in that school who continuously works with a group of 15 to 20 students in the school so that you have what's called sort of like, you know, distributed counseling, right? So you don't just have one counselor who's responsible for thousands and thousands of kids, but you actually have teachers who work almost in a counseling capacity with young people. And so Joe had an advisory or family group, as they called it at his school, and he started finding that in his family group, it was really helpful to have students write their poetry and share their work. And it started to become so popular that he would look up and other students wanted to be in his advisory or family group. And so that's when the principal, he and the principal talked about making it an extended day, part of the extended day programming. And it went to being you know, an after school class on Wednesday. And then they brought it back into on Fridays when they had their so-called you know, extracurricular courses. It was actually built into the Friday class. So Friday mornings, students had choices about what classes they wanted to take, and that was one of the classes you could take. And Saturday, you know, no one can make anybody go to school on Saturday, but that was voluntary. So students did that work on Saturday. Now, what power writing has looked at looked like in other places has really been in an after-school. Way. So they've done the work at um, Beacon, and they've done the work at John Jay, and a couple of other schools in Brooklyn. And now they're doing the work in like, learning centers, in housing projects, 
Um, so not even necessarily in, even in traditional schools. So it's really, and they also did a, um, uh, did the work in Filmston, um, which was really interesting because they actually had students from University Heights who were teaching the classes at Filmston, and that was giving I think the Filmston students a very different kind of education. Maybe one more. I was just going to ask, what, yeah. thank you so much for being here again. Thank you. It's so exciting. Um, what's your kind of current work right now? What's the next step that you're working on? As yeah. So um, I think many of you know that um, some of the work that I'm doing right now really looks at the intersections of our education and the school to prison pipeline. And it's really interesting because more specifically, I've been looking at youth theater work and youth as playwrights. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting kind of going from this, you know, sort of spoken word poetry sure. work to theater. Because one of the things that I think happens with the playwriting for young people is because they have to create these different characters and they have to assign dialogue to these different characters, there's some interesting problem solving that takes place in, in, in the playwriting programs that I've been working with. So you have to imagine what other people who's, who you can't really imagine being these people, but you have to imagine being these people to create the dialogue, right? Um, you have to imagine what other people are thinking. And sometimes in these contexts, because I'm working with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated girls, sometimes these other people are junior correctional officers and lawyers and judges and parents who have you know, been disappointed in their children. And so they're having to imagine their perspective. So it's really interesting seeing what happens. And these young people also write poetry. I mean, we're finding that they're also coming to the table as poets and writers. And they have, you know, they're 16 years old. They've already written like hundreds of pages of an autobiography, you know. And so they have a lot of writing. And they also just in all the work, the young people, they have the work. They just need the form. Okay, so we're not giving them voice, we're not giving them anything, they have it. We're just providing space. We're trying to provide space and opportunity and an open and permissive space where they can show okay. Thank you. So uh, another hand for uh, Dr. Thank you. Okay, okay. I just wanted to say that one of our, our poets and who you saw in the clips, Ron, came in late, so I have to acknowledge Ron. Thank you for being here. So uh, before I give these awards, one of the things that Dr. Wynn's work reminds me of is you know, a problem I think we have in education is an image problem. Right? But we often think of our kids as having an image problem. One of the things I say is if the adults that have the image problem is that the image we have of our young people and their communities is wrong. Right? And the, the, the best thing that scholarship can do is fundamentally change the way that society views as you. Right? They are not the challenge. They are our youth. They are kids with desires, with dreams, with beautiful narratives to share. And, and so this work does that. It not only talks about the doing of it, but it does it as talking about that. And, and that's really important. The other um, really important part of this work, I think, is um, that there's this community of research. Right? Where the kids now, adults, um, alumni, are sharing, the teachers are sharing, and then Maisha's sharing. Um, and, and so that, that, that's such a powerful model to emulate. And I wanted to acknowledge we not only have um, university-based folks in here, but we also have uh, several teachers from the Thurgood Marshall Academy that are working in Literacy Teachers Initiative. So I just wanted you to raise your hand so I could <laughs> shout out to the teachers. That are, there. <laughs> are also doing this kind of work, right? And um, you know, uh, working with, uh, with, with Jody Murrah, who's a, uh, also a senior research associate here. Uh, that's important work, and you know the, the Martin Luther King challenge, you know, still is applicable 45 years later. Yeah. That we teach so well that there are no other excuses about what's right. going on outside of the classroom. That uh, the classroom is a strong enough intervention. Right. So uh, Maisha started by saying this is a story. It's a powerful story. It's a powerful story about power <coughs> writing, but it's also a powerful story about our potential in this. Right, so uh, that's why I wanted her to talk to you today. This kind of work is going on in New York City. This kind of work is going on in Atlanta. Um, powerful work that is a part of the solution. So in a tradition um, we are establishing, uh, I'd like to give uh, framed uh, copies of our flyer, our program 
Um, so I just like to give these to you. And these are for you. Uh, just thank you for sharing your wisdom and intellect with us and being part of the faculty. Thank you. So uh, we're going to go ahead and eat. Um, there's food over there. Um, and thank you all for coming.